Take a look at that tweet that the president put out overnight. He called it a great success. And you might scratch your head and say, how is it possible that the president can say this was a tremendous success tonight when he's been effectively rebuked in the House of Representatives, losing control? We're going to have a Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, coming in. They're going to wield subpoena power, all those politically disastrous things uh, for the president. But I think in some ways the president is right here uh, in, in this sense. This is a president who needs a foil politically. He, he thrives when he has a fight. He thrives when he has a political enemy. And in a weird, ironic way, in 2016, the president suffered from catastrophic success. He, he rolled the table, wiped all of his enemies from the face of the board. Hillary Clinton went into retirement in Chappaqua. Uh, there was nobody to fight left to fight with for the president, and he had to uh, work with Republicans and pass legislation. This is a Republican uh, president who thrives when he is in a political fight and now he's going to have a credible political enemy on the scene in the Democrats in the House of Representatives. His complaints about Democrats over the past two years weren't really credible because the Democrats didn't have any power. Now though those complaints will be credible and he'll be able to run against right. somebody again and I think this president thrives in that situation and I think it might set him up very well for 2020. The other thing that helps him is when it comes to the Senate guys is the federal judiciary, right? Mm -hmm. It's the Senate that confirms those judges. And to the degree that you want those federal judges to roll back the administrative state, which they began, which they began over the last two years, that's going to be even more possible with the makeup of the Senate right now. And by the way, Mitch McConnell right. doesn't have to be worried about bothering with legislation because he knows it's not going to be worth working on because he doesn't have the House anymore. Right. And Michelle, to, to your point on that, the judiciary uh, has been very import, important for uh, some Republicans who maybe didn't choose President Trump as their first choice, but he has done what he promised them, which is to put conservatives on the Supreme Court. And that really rallied um, that base. If Clarence Thomas wanted to retire, Michelle, I think he'd feel comfortable retiring now. There, that's been a uh, scuttlebutt. Uh, yep. I don't know. But, and there's a couple others that you know, or, or, who knows what's going to happen. And it's but. a much more enduring legacy, Joe, right? Because yeah. you put a judge on in so their the 40s Senate. So and the they can Senate. last a long time. The Senate's six years. I mean, it, we're doing this again with the House in two years. Right. right. So, John, the well, question... we're doing it again with the Senate in two right. years, too. Yeah, right? but yeah. not with, yeah, but they... It, they, the guys Republicans that got, are going to have more uh, I know, seats but the, to defend. But, John, that. the four that got picked, the four or five that they gained... In this election, are, are there for six years? So. John, John, yeah, that's true. In terms, John, in terms of the calculus now that uh, that Pelosi and, and the Democrats are going to have to think about, in terms of where to cooperate, where not to cooperate, and and specifically, I want to talk about these financial issues, these money issues that we've been talking about this morning. Where do you see the opportunity for bipartisan? Uh, uh, support or for them to come together. Is infrastructure something real? Is health care an issue you think that they, they would allow that for? Or does everybody just say, talk to each other's hands, we're not going to do anything for the next two years, this, this truly is gridlock? I think the latter. Uh, it is unlikely that we're going to get uh, cooperation. Uh, it is true that Democrats, like President Trump, have talked a lot about big infrastructure programs, but I think the fact that uh, deficits are now uh, heading back to a trillion dollars means that the Republican Senate is not likely to go along with a big infrastructure spending program. So I think they'll there'll be talk about that, not much action. Same is true on prescription drug prices, where the Democratic House, Nancy Pelosi, I talked to her last night. She said, I'm going to push the president. Uh, he says he wants to reduce prescription drug prices. So do I. Problem is, the president's taken uh, what Pelosi and the Democrats consider minor steps. I don't think the Republican senators are going to be comfortable with any more, or if they're comfortable even with the, the president's steps, John, which pharmaceutical industry uh, are not in favor of. John, that's a really interesting point, though. If you think that Pelosi is willing to work with the president on that, how, how likely would you game it at this point that? that some sort of plan to try and stop gains for prescription, prescription drug prices actually takes place? Not likely. Uh, I think there'll be talk about it. Uh, it's possible that small steps could be taken, uh, but I, I would not expect much. The same is true on trade, by the way. Democrats uh, lean toward the uh, Trump protectionism. There are a lot of Democrats who like the tariffs that the president has introduced. Uh, but when I talked to Pelosi last night, are you going to approve this new deal that uh, uh, with Canada and Mexico? She said, no idea. It's a work in progress. We haven't taken a look at it. So I think Democrats are likely to push the president from the left uh, on trade. And uh, I would not expect action on that front. And Andrew, to answer your question earlier about China, I don't think China wakes up in a better position at all here because 
if there's one area where there's bipartisanship, it's that Democrats and Republicans suddenly seem to agree that China is a problem. You can disagree about the methodology, right. but he, the president has dragged everyone towards him on what so, so this China gets interesting. Did China, did China make a mistake in terms of its timing, its calculus, that if they waited, that somehow the president would be in a weaker position? No. You're making no. the argument. Are they in a stronger position, or is this just a default position? They needed the, they needed the information. They needed to see what was going to happen, right? I mean, they, they wanted to know this midterm result and see if the president's in a stronger or weaker position. Ultimately, the president's in a slightly weaker position, but not dramatically weaker position. And so that'll inform the Chinese negotiating strategy. And I, I think, think the variable here is President Trump. He personally is going to be on the ballot uh, in 2020. And I think... Uh, he is the one who's been driving this story. He's the one that's been driving this trade conflict. And the more uh, uh, unsettled the markets get, the more potential fallout you see from the economy, the more he is likely to dial it back himself on his own hook. He's got the ability to do that.